The sound you hear is that of a grave being dug on a hillside in a lonely section of England in the 17th century. And that was English thunder of the era. And that, a soft English drizzle. Water, earth, sky, elementals. Surrounding, James Alsop. Money clipper, highwayman, father-in-law, grave digger. It'll take him about another hour to finish, and about another hour to give it a corpse. For in that time, James Alsop will add murder to his other attributes. And tonight, my report to you on the Alsop family, how it diminished and grew again. Crime Classics, a new series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. The year, 1673, and the place, Ham, a small village about four miles from London, situated in the county of Essex. Now, the month is March, at the tail end of a wild winter, a winter of great snows, much poverty, and much returning to the earth of the folk of Ham, young and old. Never was there such a winter within the memory of what villagers were left alive. And now that the snows had melted and the first warmth blew across the heath and into cold stone rooms, there was stirring among the hamlings who had survived. Man and wife smiled on each other where yesterday had been chill. Life must go on. But what of those whom the ravages of the season and starvation had made lonely? What of, say, a widow? What of, say, widow Ursula? who lost her husband to the wild dogs two days after Christmas. What of her? Well, let's see. You be lonely, are you, widow? I. Ah, it was a cruel thing has happened to your husband. Cruel? And now it is the springtime. Aye, mm. and March is soft on the moors. April is a good time for marrying, widow. When I married last, it was in April. It was April after a soft winter when my husband built this house that we married. It was a good marriage. April is soon, and you should have another husband. You're a widow of good credit and competent estate, and you'd make a young man a comely bundle. Teddy? Ah, you're welcome, widow Ursula. A comely bundle indeed. How long has it been since your wife passed on, James, also? Ah, uh, six years, come next blooms very day. I heard she was a shrew. A witch? A shrew, a gollygog. But a woman of fervor, and she fruited me with two sons. Aye, I have seen the younger one. He said to me the widow Ursula had looked upon him. Aye, a robust lad, sinewy. Uh, will you marry my son? What do you call him? Christopher. Christopher. A likely name for April. And Ursula will make a likely bride. Aye. Morning. Oh, father, what did the widow say? Will she marry my brother? She will. To us, William. Aye. So, my brother Christopher will take a bride. Your brother is not like us. He needs a woman to take care of him. He is a dote. Perhaps... And cowardly. Maybe. For instance, he needs his father to propose for him. He has a shy manner. Cowardly. For instance, down there, where the carriage will roll soon. Would he have the courage to stop it and point a knife and demand money or a life and mean it? No. Not Christopher. There. Around the hill's curve, the carriage. Father? Aye. Aye.
So the two of them, father and son William, galloped down the hillside, donned masks, and stopped the carriage. And with a well-a-day and cocked pistols, they robbed the driver and the passenger. History records that the passenger, as coincidence would have it, was none other than Dame Maggie Chavez, who, it may be assumed, was even then on the first leg of her mad dash to Lisbon. Gallants that they were, the highwaymen took from the lady only her gold coins. Her jewelry, the famous mementos from the Viscount of Gloucester, was not touched. Uh, this might have been, however, because of the hiding places for gems that the dame is famous for. And with another well-a-day, James Alsop and William rode down to the town of Ham, and to home, and to their workshop. Here, they divested themselves of garments necessary to robbing on the road, placed them in a trunk, took out a pair of shears, and went to work. Uh, this year's mintage is harder than last year's. Work, meaning clipping off small edges of the gold coins. Decreasing the diameter, in other words, without decreasing the face value. So, when you were finished, you had the original gold coins and gold clippings as a bonus. Else the shears are dulled. Else you, father, are growing older <laughs> and weaker. Aye. 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 I said it. Did you now? Oh. What do you say now? Would you have too much blood in your mouth, son William? I... I meant a jest. I... Ask your pardon. Get I... back to work. There's a pile of sovereigns on the table to be clipped and clippings taken to London to be sold. Aye. Yeah. Who be it? Christopher. Come in, son. Hello, son. Hello, father. Hello, William. Mm. Did the day go well for you, son? I dreamed how it would be to take a wife. <laughs> you like the taste of blood, William? I dreamed how it would be to take a wife. Oh, and it was a fine dream. Mm, yeah, I spoke to the widow worse, you learn. And asked her what I told you, father? I. Will she have me? In April. I'm grateful to you. You're a good son, Christopher. You make your father proud. Did you have a good day on the road, Father? No, that's thoughtful you asked. Aye, a good day indeed. A carriage with a rich lady. Ah, and much gold, I see. One thing, son. When you're with wife, no talk of this and what happens on the road. Not a whisper on it. Oh, not a whisper? No. Yeah. We have to do much clipping, your brother and I. Take a handful of coins, lad. Buy some things for April. When it came, it was the mildest April in years, and the good townsfolk of Ham wore homespun linen of most feathery weight for the nuptials, the widow Ursula to Christopher Alsop. There was much gaiety. Laughter spilled, as did the cooling spiced mead. And, as sometimes happens at such festivals, a group of the younger set thought they spied a druid <laughs> and ran off into the woods to give it chase. But the older set, the ones who had already chased their druids, stayed. And they smiled kindly upon the bride Ursula as she took the hand of Christopher and led him into the warm stone cottage. My husband. My bride. You dance well, the Saraband husband. <laughs> Do you not have a good word for my jig? In the Saraband, you whirled and lifted me high. You are comely, bride Ursula. You are young and handsome. I love thee. And you will gentle me and... Be ardent. I. And I to you. Christopher. I. Your father is rich. <laughs> he is. He has told me I do not need to employ myself at anything for a year as a wedding gift, if I wish it. Oh, he must be very rich then. What does he do for his riches? <laughs> I cannot say. But you are husband. Uh, then come to me. <sighs> yes. Which was the talk in April and in May when the bloom was on the sedge. Come, dearie, tell your wife what your daddy dear does for his riches. And in June when the drone bee danced for its queen. If you do not tell me, dearie, I shall be unhappy. 
and you shall be sorry. And for the rest of the summer, love and curiosity and a Christopher who wouldn't talk about his father. But in September, when the first leaf dropped... Now, what does he do, your father? Come here. I will not. Bride. Wife now. And I ask you, what does your father do for his riches? <sighs> what curiosity is yours, Ursula? And who would not be curious? The way your father is hardly home, nor your brother. The way they ride the road so often and after lock themselves in that room. What do they there? And why am I not permitted there in their workroom? And why does your brother journey to London so often? Come here. When you will answer me, not before. I will not answer you. I'll tell you this only. It is September and you have become a shrew. You will rue the day you called me that name. You will rue it. Turn the horses, William. Aye. Uh, take a fresh horse. After, we'll clip the coins and you will go down to London. Aye. What uh, ails you, father? There's no humor in you anymore. You worry about Christopher? He's not happy with his wife. <laughs> As I said it. He said she's a shrew. And what woman is not? That she's curious. As the woman Alice is. That she needs to know what we do, you and I. So she would gossip about it. But we are highwaymen and money clippers. She would gossip and the law would hear of it and we would jig from a gallows. It grieves me. It would be a, a terrible thing. Hello, father-in-law, brother-in-law. I had never been here before. In the workshop before. I thought to clean it. To dust a bit. What are these clippers for? Get out of here. Get out of here before I kill you. She will gossip, father. Aye. And the law will hear of it. Aye. The gallows. And death. Not for us. To work, William. And they clipped a pile of sovereigns, and William took the clippings to London town. And the rest of the night, James Alsop sat with his thoughts. In the false dawn, he came to a conclusion. His daughter-in-law had to go for good. You are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Highland. All America is in CBS Radio's 21st Precinct. Tuesday nights every week, the Star's Address brings you gripping and suspenseful stories of behind-the-scenes police work in the world's biggest city. Hear 21st Precinct on most of these same stations tomorrow night. And now, once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on the Allsop family, how it diminished and grew again. England in the 1670s. It was a mess. First of all, the English didn't like the Dutch, and the Dutch felt the same about the English, and they were constantly sending each other's frigates to the bottom. The King of England was Charles II famed for being a member of the Stuart family, for marrying with Catherine Berganza, and for peeling the oranges of one Nell Gwynne. 
It was, as I have indicated, a yeasty time, foment everywhere. Colonists were going off in every which direction, to America, to India, and to the Caribbees. It was the decade, too, of the great Feathergill hoax, and it was the decade of plague and fire. Let's look again at a corner of it. The year, 1673. And the place, the village of Ham, and a woman named Ursula walking through a meadow at dusk. Did you have a good ride? Midland, I think. Only Midland. What are you talking about? I saw the woman Ursula walking through the meadow, as you said she would be. And did you kill her, as I said you should do? I am not sure. Therefore... Therefore what? I am willing to take but half the amount of money which you promised me. I promised you a fee, assassin, for the killing of Ursula. I hired your sword for a death. No half uh, payments for work not completed. There's no fault of mine. I stuck her with my sword, but she moved quickly away. Then I saw some people who were coming, attracted by her cry. And my son, William, who sent you to me from London, said you were the finest of assassins. Another day, and I'll try again. Go back to London. My pay. I... <laughs> that be your pay, a knock about the head. What you deserve get you back to London. What do you think, Father? That your wife is a fortunate one. That the wounds are not grave. The villagers who saw the attack said a rider in a cloak and mask chased her about the meadow with a sword. For what reason? For what reason I cannot conceive? Ooh. A mystery. Who would want to do murder on such a fine woman? Huh? Yesterday you called her a witch. Well, aye, even worse. But I did not mean it. Yeah. As I said, what has happened? A mystery. Who would want to kill her? Ooh, your wife is a provoking woman. She walks alone in the meadow at dusk. Oh, if she ever recovers, I will tell her to do so no more. Hmm. While I'm gone for the surgeon in Yorkshire, you will take care of my wife, father. Aye, that I will. I'll watch over your wife. And young Christopher rode off to Yorkshire. And what with William in London selling coin clippings, James Alsop was left in his house with Ursula, his daughter-in-law. September 9th. And a gathering storm. And this... What? What? Ursula. Thirsty. As a body is wont to get when it has been stabbed. What? And the man who could slake her thirst moves. But not toward Ursula. Toward the tool shed for a shovel. Then toward the hill. You know why. That's right to dig a grave. And while he was digging, you remember, it started to rain. And James Alsop lifted his mouth to it because the body is wont to get thirsty when it is digging a grave. But Alsop finished his task, took Shovel back to Tool House, and did what quite a few grave diggers do, even to this day. <sighs> Marky, another... Good evening to you. <laughs> Good evening, Judy. Buy a hollyhock. Oh, buy one. <laughs> Yours a father and you keep your hock. Wear it yourself. You may pin it on me if you like. <laughs> Hocks become you. I have only two more to sell, but I have nothing to do. And no one to sing my song to. Oh. Uh, tonight I'm busy, Judy. Oh, 
could you be busy with in such a storm? To help my daughter-in-law on a journey. A journey? To where? To her cousin in Scotland. Oh, if I had a drink, Mr. Althorpe, I would drink to a safe return. Ah, barkeep. Three drinks. One for me, one for the lady, and for yourself, barkeep. Yeah. Well, now we will drink to the safe journey and the safe return of my daughter-in-law, Ursula, who goes to visit her cousin in Scotland and who probably will not return for a year or so. to go and find out I was a thief, did you not? I can't stand to see you suffer, girly. You will never suffer again. Now then, up with you. There's a burying to be done. Pastoral scene in England under Charles II. Cutthroat carrying victim through big storm to grave. A few more details. Darkness torn apart by lightning. Silences shattered by thunder. And the earth, a sea of mud. It was perhaps 300 yards to the hillside. And when James Alsop got there, the grave he had dug was gone. Washed away. So, what we've got now is the same pastoral scene in reverse. Cutthroat, carrying victim through big storm, back to scene of crime. Sure. Cutthroat in a quandary? Mm, the plan was to bury you neatly, Ursula. Now what? Proving that things gang after glee. Yeah. I told everyone you were going for a visit. The question. What shall I do with you? Seeking the answer. The answer? Not quite. Aye! This time the answer. Change everybody into warm, dry clothes. <laughs> and having done this, the stroke of genius. <laughs> Remove the glass from a window frame into the room. Hide it. And set up a cry. Murder! Murder most foul! Help! Thieves have come and made Murder! Help! Help! A thief? Aye, constable. And killed your poor daughter-in-law. Yesterday a man tried to do it while she walked the meadow. I've heard. And now he has succeeded. I heard a cry from Ursula. I came quick to her, but only in time to see her attacker flee. Flee? How? Through the window, sir. Which window? That one. That one? With no glass in it? Of course, that one. And you're sure of it? Aye. Hmm. Come here. If the thief and murderer escaped through this window, how did he get through the cobweb which covers the opening? Sir? Stretched across the window frame is a cobweb, as you see. From side to side, so. From top to bottom, so. Sir? Then how did this thief of yours get through it? Sir? You're under arrest, James Allsop. 
Arrest. For the murder of your daughter-in-law. Johnny? The chains. James Alsop was committed at Colchester Jail. His sons, William and Christopher, were not to be located. Justice was swift and sure. James Alsop was sentenced and led to the gallows. And as he mounted them, a thing happened. Wait! Wait! In the name of the king! Do not hang that man. A messenger with good news, especially if your name was James Alsop of Ham in the year 1673, and the hangman had just indicated that you stick your neck in a noose. New evidence from London. Thank heaven. The man who calls himself Topham says he can prove that James Alsop is no murderer. He saw a thief leave the place of murder through the door. Ah, ah, that's the way it was. I forgot. Bring down the accused from the gibbet. But our story still has a dolorous end. Mr. Topham from London turned out to be none other than the missing William Alsop, son of James. He could have stayed in London, safe and alive, so he must have loved his father dearly to have taken such a chance. But the only way he changed history was this. Father? Son, William. What happened to Christopher? Well, he had heard what happened to his wife, so asked himself, why return to Ham? He stayed in Yorkshire, where he met the widow Patricia. She was comely, and the next April they were wed. She made puddings and was an uncurious woman. They lived long and happily, and gave to the world eight Alsops. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. The Alsop family, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. In tonight's story, Ben Wright was heard as James. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. Featured in the cast were Herb Butterfield, Ellen Morgan, Betty Harford, Terry Kilburn, Richard Peel, and Raymond Lawrence. Roy Rowan speaking. And here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, Rome, Italy in the year 62. My report to you will concern a young chap who wanted to murder his mom. It's listed in my files as your loving son, Nero. Thank you. Good night. Later tonight, CBS Radio invites you to an hour of sprightly romantic comedy as the Lux Summer Theater stars Ann Baxter in The Affairs of Susan. Lovely Ann has the most difficult time making up her mind over her varied assortment of suitors until... But suppose you hear it all for yourself later tonight on most of these same stations when CBS Radio presents The Lux Summer Theater. America's 45 million radio families... Listen most to the CBS Radio Network.